Thank you, Elise. Welcome, everybody. Technology is a part of our work lives as well as our personal lives. And like many other skills, there's a foundational set that anyone with a career in technology should know and keep up to date, which we'll delve into during the session with two DeVry professors. Dr. Natalie Baxmansky is currently a professor and faculty chair at DeVry University in the College of Engineering and Information Sciences, where she teaches physics, computer programming, electronics, calculus, algebra, and statistics. She earned a PhD in engineering with a concentration in mechanics and a certificate in nuclear engineering at the University of Akron in 2016. She has published numerous papers on the static and dynamic analysis of layered composite plates with multi-phase coupling and non-local effects. Dr. Wadsivansky's area of expertise in computational mechanics has been applied to multiple areas in STEM, where, in addition to enhancing student experience in the classroom, she serves as a mentor to a first Tech Challenge robotics team. Dr. Jude Lamore is a professor of engineering and information sciences at DeVry College of New York. He earned a PhD in management information systems with an emphasis in information assurance. Jude also holds the CISSP and CISM certifications in information security from the International Information System Security Certification Consortium and the Information System Audit and Control Association, respectively. He has held many titles from security engineer up to security manager. Jude has designed, implemented, and managed many security projects for large enterprises in the financial sector in New York City. He has also taught end user security awareness, as well as trained security and network engineers on best practices in regards to protecting organizational data assets. Jude currently holds the Cisco Certified Instructor Trainer Certification in Networking and Security, where he trains practitioners about firewalls, instruction detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, router security, switch security, and wireless security. For our audience, please enter your questions in the chat and we'll be sure to answer as many as possible. Welcome to our professors. So uh, Dr. Labor and Dr. Waxmansky, I know I went through your biographies and your background, uh, but maybe each of you can fill us in a little bit more on how you got started in teaching and what really you know, makes you passionate and excited about teaching overall and here at DeVry. Uh, maybe Dr. Waxmansky, if you wanna kick us off. Sure, I'd be glad to. I mean, talking about why I'm passionate about teaching, I mean, I'd be more than happy to start about that. Now, um, my, as you've um, mentioned, I just recently in the past four years earned my PhD and I went straight into teaching because that's been my passion. Education has been something that's been important to me my entire life and that's been ingrained in me. Um, my parents, they immigrated from Poland, um, escaping communism during a time that they had no educational opportunities. And they knew that if they would stay in their country, they would not be able to further their careers or attain anything. They truly instilled in me that knowledge is power. And I've just love learning. I have this unquenchable thirst for knowledge. And when you're learning, you're also teaching. So those two go hand in hand. Now, that's something that I inspire for my students because many of them too are also first generation immigrants or first generation college students such as myself. So um, at DeVry, where we, we are able to have that closer connection with our students. I didn't want to teach at a university that, you know, I would have hundreds of students in the classroom. I really wanted to connect with my students and get to know them and give them the motivation and the support they need in order to achieve their educational goals. That's great, Dr. Waxmansky. Uh, something in your biography I wanted to ask you about. So it says that you serve as a mentor to the first Tech Challenge Robotics team. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about what that is and how you serve as a mentor? It sounds really exciting and interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd love to talk about that as well. So at the, um, I'm based in the Chicago area with DeVry and we have a, uh, in one of our campuses, we have a dual degree program. 
partnered with the Chicago Public Schools. So this robotics team is based with that Advantage Academy program that we offer. And in the past three years that I've been mentoring this team, we've actually um, we've actually been able to get to the state competition um, each of those times. So I feel like this upcoming year, you know, <laughs> bar is setting high, <laughs> pressure's up. But I love it because the thing is that these students they get the hands-on experience of building something you know not just that but they program the robot in both autonomous and driver controlled it is so much fun working with these students i i really do enjoy it that sounds great and and good luck next year um Thanks. quick question for you from the chat um how is this first robotics team working during the pandemic how does that work now yeah, so during the summer, since it is a high school program, um, we kind of take some time off. Mm -hmm. Usually what we would do is we would um, be still meeting and practicing, um, learning about like practicing driving the robot, learning about different mechanisms. Uh, but what we do is um, what we've done this entire time is because we also faced a Chicago public school teacher strike. So we were kind of on and off <laughs> all year. But in any case, uh, we have this chat that we all connect with one another. So uh, first robotics, uh, there's different tiers. Unfortunately, the highest tier, the first um, first robotics itself um, has been called off just because of the uh, mass sheer mm, number of people yeah. that have to participate. But First Tech Challenge is still supposed to go. Uh, <laughs> Chicago Public school, Schools is still a question mark, but you know, we're still communicating, we're still sharing uh, different, uh, different just videos and talking about next year what we want to do. So the students are still engaged and motivated even though they're off for the summer. That's so exciting. So thank you for that, Dr. Waxmansky. Dr. Lamore, maybe um, if you want to fill us in too a little bit on, you know, uh, how did you get into teaching and what, what gets you excited and passionate about teaching? Uh, thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that I am originally, my parents are from Haiti, myself as well. And I, I remember when I was in high school, uh, it was very much important for us to to go to school of course the future it's it's with nothing if you don't really educate yourself and, and i actually spent all my my years there i remembered going to high school with no books whatsoever and when i came to the u.s and i saw we have libraries and i, I couldn't believe mm -hmm. that people were not reading books i said oh my god we have <laughs> so many books here which is exciting and what was fascinating is i remember my second year in college as an engineering major and a math major i was doing a, an internship at brookhaven national lab and so many times i was doing lab in electronics and if we ran into some problems i would go to my professors at the time the professors will explain that the circuit we design was correct the simulation was right the mathematical calculation was correct but if you make the circuit, it fully doesn't work. And we were asking questions, but why doesn't it work? The professor kind of didn't know. So I brought some of my circuit projects to my mentor, who was an engineer at Brookhaven National Lab. He was a very young person, 35 mm -hmm. years old. He was able to help me understand what was wrong with the circuit. And then I was asking him, I don't understand, you only have a bachelor's degree, but my professor has a PhD. And then he explained to me that, Jude, it's a very different thing when people have uh, you know, theoretical information if they never work in the the field. So I've always been passionate about teaching, but I didn't want to become a theoretical mm -hmm. professor. So what I did, I, I graduated, I worked for many, many years in the field, acquired experience, and of course, the right, the right alignment with the kind of things that I want to do where you're not a professor who just have all the theoretical knowledge, but cannot build the thing that you're talking about, you can't make it happen. And you will tell the students, don't worry about it, you get full credit. So when, when I when I heard about the fry, and I understood what they did, and I found out not only that, as Dr. Rex Mansi mentioned, we actually align very well because also I'm a first generation college graduate. And also we have a place where you can not just teach theoretical, but you also have the practical aspect and being so close to your students, making a difference in their lives. I couldn't ask for anything better than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lamore. And you know, it's, it's interesting you mentioned um, you know, that you kind of um, combine the teaching with the real world experience. And it says in your bio, you know, that you've held some positions, a security engineer to security manager, you know, so I, I'm assuming that's where you got your real, you know, your work experience. 
maybe just tell us a little bit more about some of uh, your work experience and how that comes into your classroom. Uh, thank you again, Lisa. Um, so just to make it short, I guess, because it could be quite long, <laughs> I, I, I have done a lot of different things. So for example, I work in the telephone sector, so for voice systems uh, for many companies companies. I also spent many years in the data center system. So where we work for some people who want to talk about server systems, uh, I work on servers. Uh, we talk about voice system, video systems. I actually spent many years on the uh, team of security team on for many, many organizations where we protect the data system, especially some of the Wall Street firms as well. And uh, so combined with that, all the way to management, where I was able to work with colleagues and design new data centers, implement data centers, and I'm talking like thousands of servers. So that allows me to have this practical experience from the point of view of voice system, video systems, data systems, and then the management aspect of the big picture budget and all these other things. And so when you're teaching those students, it's not about, well, that's what the book says, but yes, we have the practical aspect to guide them effectively, which is the most fascinating part of it. Mm -hmm. Great. So maybe we'll, um, you know, kind of uh, dive into the meat of our uh, uh, session today. Um, so DeVry has something called um, the Tech Core that's in um, a, a good number of its technology programs. And so maybe Dr. Waxmansky, you can um, expand and tell us a little bit more about what, what the Tech Core is and uh, you know, why do you feel it's so important? Yeah, absolutely. So the Tech Core is the strategically designed curriculum um, that we as professors developed, and we developed it to help students build a foundation of interdisciplinary skills they'll need for the new type of IT specialist that is needed in the world right now with the Internet of Things. Um, so our Tech Core, uh, the, the path itself revolves around this unique learning rubric, and it's called People, Process, Data, and Devices. So the people, right, we're connecting people together, processes. So the, um, the people are being, the, the connection with the people, right, is be becoming more efficient, and we're connecting them in more valuable ways. Uh, the things, right? We have devices that are being connected uh, to the internet and they're collecting data itself, right? Um, so all that is based around it and all those skills that the students are learning related to operating systems, programming, hardware, connectivity, and the security of those connections, that gives this um, whole well-rounded experience to prepare the students to become this new type of IT specialist, as I mentioned, because you don't need to, like now you don't need to just know programming or just know hardware. Um, all these things are integrated together in this process, the people, the data, the things, it's one whole process. So you kind of need to know a little bit of a little bit of everything. So that's why it's so important that um, students get this well-rounded experience around the tech core. Now, uh, Natalie, you mentioned something called um, the Internet of Things. And I know, you know, probably a lot of people have heard of that, but maybe they don't know exactly what that is or what you mean by that. So could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So the Internet of Things, I mean, now is so much more than just computers and smartphones. It actually is because of smartphones that the Internet of Things has really exploded. Um, think of Alexa. Think of a nest, think of the ring, right? All the, basically what the, any, any device that is connected to the internet that has some sort of sensor, it's collecting data. Um, that itself is, is an internet of things object. So um, I, I hope that kind of paints a better picture of what internet of things is about. There's so much to talk about it. We have a whole course just about it. <laughs> we could do a whole session on the internet of things. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Dr. Lamour, um, you know, can you give us a little bit of insight, you know, this tech core, you know, how were DeVry's uh, professors involved in um, creating it? And, um, and, and, and why do you, you know, feel this is uh, so important that, you know, there was um, obviously professor faculty involvement in the creation? 
absolutely. Uh, so the tech core, as Dr. Waksmanski mentioned, it's it's providing a foundation for for students. And one of the things that's critical, it, it's doing two things in my view that's critical. One of them is that um, if you enroll in a program, especially people that enroll, that you could be thinking about computer science or computer information system, you may be interested in uh, engineering, you may be interested, maybe you heard about network OIT, information technology, or maybe cybersecurity, but you're kind of like really not sure. And so what happened is the tech corp provide a foundational environment where students not only it's required, that's part one, but part two, uh, as Dr. Waxmancy mentioned, it is the future too, where uh, you cannot have the skill set and say, I'm a hardware person or the person who, I, for example, you're designing, um, you know, let's say a security system, or maybe you're designing some kind of um, uh, camera or something for, for, you know, for monitoring, but then you're saying, well, I don't understand what the software has to do with it because today when, when we put a camera somewhere, somebody wants to remote the access to camera, do something, look at intelligent information. So you need some understanding of software. So we don't want somebody who just go around. The fight has always been about the, the, you know, the whole, whole, you know, wholeness, not just some pieces of things. So the whole system. So the idea is we provide that foundation and some basic introduction of software scripting introduction or automation we provide some understanding of the hardware itself electronics that's driving this and then we provide some understanding of that you need to access it on a, you know, remotely then how does the network function but at the same time if you access in this remotely then the next question becomes how safe is it or how secure is this mm -hmm. connection so we need you to have that understanding so the wholeness is whether you're an engineer whether you're somebody who's writing the code then you understand wait a minute my code could be has some bugs that make it a little bit unsafe for people to use and then if you're designing as an engineer then you ask well what's the intelligent component of it that means what's the software that will drive this thing to make it more useful for the end user and then at the same time we talk about this thing has to be as dr waxmanski mentioned has to be over a network there is no uh devices being created that you saw they cannot be on the network well that's garbage because nobody wants to use them today so the idea of the same iot internet of things which give you devices they don't have a keyboard or mon uh, monitors like your laptops of stuff but they still have they have to be on the network everything whether it's your doorbell system everything is pretty much on the network your refrigerator your microwave they come in ready to be wireless ready connected but yes they have no keyboard no mouse but they all being pulled and data being collected and have to actually work seamlessly with other devices on the network so the tech core provide that foundation for the students first to allow them to find a way to figure out what do i really want to do and second it builds this integrated person that fully understand how these different fields interact together and to understand what they do at the end of the day for customers yeah you know you mentioned um something interesting that um you know and i know this um this is true of some students you know they they know that they um are, are interested in technology right but they don't know exactly what area of technology they might want to go into. And um, it, it sounds like um, because of this foundational knowledge from the tech core, um, they could, you know, help assist students in that regard. You know, is, is that is that an accurate statement? And maybe if you have any comments on that, how maybe, you know, the tech core might help somebody who is a little, you know, knows know they're interested in technology, but not really sure where what direction they want to go and how could the tech core help them out? Is that for me, uh, Lisa? I can, I can, I can answer that. Yes. Yeah. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Go okay. ahead, Doctor Lamore. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, the the tech core provides some foundation in basic operating systems. Something everybody needs to know. So, for example, everybody's using Windows. You may be using a Mac OS X, or maybe you're using Linux system to connect right now. Some of us using Android, some people using iOS, but it's an operating system that drives the interaction between the hardware and then the person who's able to interface with it. The tech core provides that capability and that's very critical. Everybody has to use some type of operating system to actually use any computing environment. And then, so the tech core introduced 
you know, operating system. The tech core also introduced basic wireless and wired network infrastructure. Uh, so you get your feet wet there too. The tech core introduced basic electronics. So the very basic electronics doesn't take you so high level where you need to know so much stuff to overpower you. It's just the ability to see, oh my God, that's how you can do mm -hmm. you know, an alarm system. I didn't know that's how the traffic light system worked. And, and so they understand that. Uh, the tech core also introduced the students to the cyber part because you take at least some courses where you do hands-on though, but we're not talking theoretical because everything we do with the tech core has a purely hands-on component, especially the project. It's fully hands-on where students building something, where you're making something for every class you take. So at that point, the students will kind of get their feet wet to figure out, hmm, I really love that operating system course I took, and there was a pathway for it. I really love that part of virtualization. Well, there's a pathway for it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like the kind of thing it does. Or maybe you want to be a cybersecurity person and you get your feet wet. <clears throat> What's interesting though, is that none of the credits you took you lost. I mean, there, there are some places you go, yep. you go to school, and if you you cannot be an engineer and then try to be computer science and take a bunch of credits, it doesn't work that way because you're gonna lose credit. Where they say, okay, those those enough credits you took for over here for computer science, sorry, we can't use them. But the beauty of the tech core is that it sits at the foundation, and everything you take still goes on. Whether you're a cyber, an engineer, an IT purely infrastructure, and and computer information systems, whatever it is you want to do it continues to build on it. And this is not lost information. It's critical information that you would need to have anyway to be a fully well-rounded person in today's environment. Yeah, that sounds like a great uh, benefit for our students. Sorry, Dr. Waxmanski, it looks like you had a comment as well. So go yeah, ahead. I wanted to add on to that. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. All great options for our students. But in addition to the things that um, Dr. Lamore mentioned, uh, we do also introduce students to programming. And on top of all that, we don't have the student, like the students don't have to decide right away based off of all those things we listed, right? There's all like a variety of paths that they can take but we, there's also the undecided option. So, <laughs> if you can't make up your mind and you like it all, you're taking all the classes that still are on the same path. So it's this tech core path, as I like to, to yeah. call it. It really is like a pathway um, where, where you're building your skills um, one on top of the other that are never lost, just as uh, Dr. Lamore just so eloquently said. <laughs> Like I said, what a great benefit for our students. Um, but maybe talk a little bit more, Dr. Wixmanski, if you can, about maybe what else do you feel um, is in the tech core that's unique, um, you know, for, that sets DeVry apart? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Lamore was talking a little bit about how every course has a project. Um, and the students get their hands-on experience. Even though they're taking a class online, they're still getting some hands-on experience. And they get it through what we call is the IoT Tech Core Kit. So it's not just like, you know, gadgets or anything like that. It's, it's, um, it's microprocessors, it's sensors, it's wires. And students are building various types of projects. It depends on the class, right? They, as Dr. Lamore said, you know, they can be there. Some build like a traffic light. Some build a IoT home security system. Some uh, use um, a sensor to collect a bunch of data because right now, right, our world is driven by data. Mm -hmm. Everything's generating data, so they do a data analytics simulation as well. So the beauty of the Tech Core Kit itself is that um, it's like a it's a lab kit that students are able to use without depending on physical laboratories in traditional brick and mortar type of locations. Um, so it DeVry has been has a reputation for getting a hands on experience. And how do you get a hands on experience when you're online? Well, that's what the DeVry Tech Core uh, kit is all about. It gives the student that hands on experience. So I know, um, and I think you touched on this a little bit, but maybe expand a little bit. How, how does this kit work for the online students? It sounds like it's portable. So how does that, do they get like sent parts and pieces? How does all that work for the online students? So the thing is, when it comes to these projects, they get so many resources available for them to build this. It's not, they're just, we're like, build a traffic system and <laughs> nothing. We really guide the students step by step. We, um, in the tech 
core, we um, we have professors that pre-record step-by-step um, videos for the students to follow along. Also, written guides for the students um, that we can kind of fit, you know, hit every student based off of their learning. Um, some people are more visual and want to see a video. Some people are more into written text, so they have the written text. But on top of all that, we also offer weekly live lessons where all the sections um, for a particular course gather all the professors, not just the, all the sections of the students, but all the professors teaching those sections, they gather once a week. These, these lessons are recorded. The professors are interacting with their students. Uh, they're giving lessons. They're guiding them also through the project as well. They're interacting with them in the chat. Um, the thing is, you're, you're not alone when you're at DeVry, the, the professors really do care for you um, and they want you to succeed. That's awesome. We have a few questions coming from the chat. So I wanted to uh, take those. Um, it, it looks like there's um, some folks in the chat who are kind of interested in learning more about industry certifications, which I know is something that's uh, probably critical, especially in the tech space. So Dr. Lamore, maybe if you could explain, um, you know, maybe for those who aren't as familiar, what are, um, you know, industry certifications and, um, you know, why, why are these so important for our students and employers? Okay, that's, that's a very interesting one because today uh, industry certification and myself, I have quite a few. Uh, <laughs> yes, I remember from your background, <laughs> yes. Word, I actually have a few more, but <laughs> the is, um, uh, there were some, some areas, especially if you're going to be a consulting person, which I used to work also for a consulting firm in the U.S., and you will go to other organizations, and many times to be a high-level consultant, uh, organization will hire you, will not hire a person, even though you have a degree, but sometimes they go, well, yes, they have experience, but how do I know for sure? They, they usually want some kind of vendor certification, especially if you're implementing a product or technology that they want to know you really. So whoever made that technology said that you qualify to, to use it. So sometimes certification is very important in the IT field. Even mm -hmm. people with experience, a lot of time what sets you apart is also the certification. So it is important. And I think the why we do that too, because many of our courses, we embed uh, concept or as well that when we encourage and we conduct sessions to and even you not know, to for students if they're interested in being certified, which we always encourage students to kind of do something beyond just getting the degree is fine but nicely to get a certification especially before you graduate it would be nice too so one of the things we do is that the tech core um concept many of them kind of early on wrap up with some guidance uh, around some certification foundation and it also we start talking about certification early mm -hmm. on so the students are aware you know like we have meetings we have clubs and as well that students can join and in personally one-on-one -on -one, we can always assist students in that in that area certifications are critical for businesses like I mentioned before because they want to know the product whatever it is to buy whether it's a router switches firewall access points or servers or some special operating system the Microsoft or Linux, whoever is implementing it, or the or the database system, suppose it was qualified by Oracle, qualified by Microsoft, or somebody beyond saying, "Well, I got a degree," and they're not really sure. But do you know best practice? Because it's important, even though you may know the theoretical concept, they depart a little bit one technology company from another, the way they implement the technology will be a little different. So when you certify, it gives the assurance, okay, you know what's different about Microsoft mm -hmm. versus Oracle. You know what's different about Cisco versus HP. So when you implemented that switch, I can have assurance since HP said you certify, you will not be doing crazy things, even though it may appear to be working. We don't want something that appeared to be working. We want it to work as per best practice recommended by HP. So mm -hmm. that's usually why we, we certify is so important even if you have a degree we definitely encourage yeah. people to do that yeah i think it's something that helps um you know like you said uh dr lamore certainly you know it, it's a stamp of assurance for an employer that you you know um have a certain skill or are you know competent in a certain area you know it also i think may help um you know help on your resume help you stand out a little bit more perhaps um, from somebody who may not have a certification as you went that extra step took that um extra 
effort, so to speak. Um, and, and Dr. Waxmansky, uh, you know, another question related to the certifications in the chat. Um, you know, there's, especially in the technology area, there's so many certifications out there. Um, how, how does a, a student or, or someone just, you know, decide, um, you know, which, which, how do they choose which one is right for them, which one to go for? And how, you know, is there a way that they can maybe determine what, what's, you know, what's the value of one certification over another? Yeah, I think the best way to look uh, for what, you know, what type of certification you want to pursue is look at the job descriptions. Um, look what they're seeking. You know, if if you want to become a software engineer, look at the job descriptions that are out there. Look at what they're requiring. You know, um, mm -hmm. we at DeVry within our tech core, we've weaved in some uh, certification test prep type of um, questions or we base some of our, our courses based off of that. Uh, but the thing is, right, the, the need for various certificates changes over time. Um, some, you know, some are more reputable than others, but ultimately you have to look at what the demand is for the type of career that you want to pursue. That's at least my my opinion and my uh, <laughs> recommendation for, for the students. Great, yeah. So, um, so another question, and I'm gonna uh, put this on Dr. Lamore since I believe from your background, you have the uh, CCNA certification. So um, there is uh, some a, a question in the chat um, they want to know what continuing education would you suggest for going into, well, it says robotics and the CCNA. So I don't know, maybe Dr. Ratzmansky, you can talk about robot robotics and Dr. Lamore, you can talk about CCNA and I'm sure they're related. <laughs> uh, so th there is no better continuing education than practice uh, in general. So I assume uh, the question, whoever asked the question, I'm not sure if they're working in the field, which would have mm -hmm. been very helpful because as you work, but then there's a trick there too, even if you work, it's nice sometimes to uh, listen to, to a seminar, even as a webinar online, because you'll get better practice. A lot of times your work is could be redundant. You may be doing something, a lot of changes occur and your company based on the size, the budget and everything, you're not necessarily learning a lot of things that's happening currently in your field. So we always encourage people, it just takes maybe once a month, you, you listen to a webinar, it could be an hour, half an hour, you'll learn a lot from that, uh, best practices. And also, even if you certify in one vendor, always look into what other vendors are doing out there. It gives you different ways of thinking versus I've only been doing HP and I don't need to know mm -hmm. what anybody else, what Juniper is doing out there, what is Cisco doing. Uh, if you're into cyber, I only do Palo Alto, I don't pay any attention to Fortinet, I, I don't want to do Cisco, Fire power or whatever it is stuff like that that's that's a poor practice uh that's not what you want you want to be open-minded well, there's a lot of um free documents from any of those vendors like they're very in-depth uh you know knowledge base where you should actually try to read a few things every so often it doesn't i mean it depends how much you want to read but still you read something eh? we got at least read something. My policy is to learn something new every day. <laughs> Not reading an article every day, but learn something. Even if it's one word in your field you never heard before, maybe a business concept you never understood, you should really keep learning, keep on learning. It's not yeah. something you just... That, that's a great that's a great philosophy, Dr. Lamore, for sure. Uh, something that we should all practice. Um, so uh, another, we, we got so many questions in the chat, which is awesome. So. Um, it, it, another question, um, they um, they want to know, uh, you know, I guess, and this is probably something that all, you know, um, recent college graduates face that, you know, they come out with their degree and they don't have a lot of experience. So, you know, how do they kind of stand out um, to employers and how do they get that first job, you know, when they just have the degree with not a lot of work experience and it seems like employers want both. Yeah, well, I think one one thing that what we do in the tech core is we have the students kind of build like almost like an e-portfolio. Through the tech core, they're building projects each and every class that they have. And through all the classes that they're building, we also encourage them to post their projects on, on like a personal website that they can share with employers. That's one way that they can stand out. They can show their employers, look, I made this. This is something that I'm capable of. Not only do I know the theory, but I've actually put it to use. 
And Dr. Lamore, do you have any uh, uh, recommendations? Uh, as well, one of the things I think people should pay the, uh, attention to that's very different. At the Vry University, we do have the students learn, they have experience, but there is difference between, I always explain to students, production experience versus non-production experience. Uh, we actually use uh, Microsoft technology, we use Linux technologies in the classroom, we use Cisco devices, routers, switches, firewalls. We actually really use an access point and we use the right sensors for electronics and we build this, this circuit. We really program with Python. So the students are not learning theoretical boxes. You do have experience, except if you made a mistake, the oops system, right? We you know when somebody said oops, it costs you nothing per se. And you can't do that in a production environment, which means if somebody is using the hospital operation room and then you do an oops while you're operating something in the system, it's a big problem. And our students do have the, the experience, except it's not in a production environment where the kind of things that will go wrong will cost the business so much. So they should also elevate that concept to realize I have been using the Cisco myself. I have been using the, you know, the access point from so and so. I really have been programming in you know in Python or C C sharp. So people would understand that, except we need that extra leg to be able to do that. And at the same time, students can also always look for internship early while they enrolled in school, mm -hmm. which helps yeah. to, to boost the experience component. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's very true. So um, the other uh, thing is, uh, let's see, another question um, from the chat. Um, they, uh, you know, want to know how they can get their resume to stand out. You know, I know, you know, we all um, know about job sites and it's easy to click submit and your resume goes in and then sometimes you feel like it goes into a black hole. So how do you, you know, get your resume to stand out, you know, so that um, you can get noticed and, and get the call at least, you know, for the interview and stuff. Yeah. Any, um, any thoughts on that, Dr. Wicks-Mansky? I know this is kind of a career services call, but... Uh, <laughs> But that's ultimately like, right, you, you want to yeah. get the education so you get the job. Yeah. But um, I think the, the big thing, like right away, make sure you have the credentials they're looking for. Yeah. Read all the requirements for the job description and see, do you meet them all? If you don't meet one of them, you're going to get booted out of the system right away. Another thing is, if you do have all the criteria that they're looking for, um, look for some of the keywords that are within the job description and put that into your resume. Don't use the same resume for the same for all the mm -hmm. jobs. Yeah. To tailor it for each and every job that you're applying for. Yeah, Dr. Lamore, do you have any comments on that? Absolutely. I, I think um there were some keywords in, in the technology field, the IT field. I mean I'm not gonna mention all the keywords per se, but uh, we have some keywords that there's software out there that looks for them. Even though you can have a long resume, but yet they are very, especially certifications keyword. Most jobs tend to have some kind of certifications. So they just flag the people that have those keywords. I mean, just to make it mm -hmm. simple, I guess one well-known certification will be like the CCNA. And a lot of jobs in networking will be looking for CCNA. So if you're looking for a security person, like introduction, entry, entry level, you may see a CompTIA Security Plus will be one of the requirements. There could be other security certifications, but they usually will flag those. So HR people, human resources, tend to have software to just look for what some keyword <laughs> IT people tell them. They really don't understand what these things are about, but they will check, check, okay, if you see yeah. that, okay, I need those resumes on the side. So you tend to be pulled first with those keywords, which is why we again say certification still matters. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, those are some great tips. And um, just, you know, something that I know from my background as well, um, you know, it, it's obviously both of you guys made some great points, but I think too, um, you know, if you want to stand out, um, you want to have a great resume, obviously, but it's also about networking too. So you can't be afraid to, if you know somebody in a company, you know, that you want to work at to reach out to them and to try and, you know, get your foot in the door and, um, it, it, you know, network and anybody you talk to, any career services person will tell you that, you know, um, a, a good resume is half of it and, and you, you got to um, grow and work your network. And that certainly helps um, get your foot in the door. Um, so, I know um, we're coming up on uh, on our time, and so maybe we'll just uh, wrap it up with one final question. Um, you know, and, I, and then maybe this is um, a little bit kind of the, the times of the day, right? You know, we're in this pandemic. 
Um, students, you know, are primarily online. Um, so, you know, uh, Dr. Lamore and Dr. Waxmansky, as, um, as professors, how do you, you know, adjust to this new primarily online environment and how are you working to keep your students engaged? Well, we um, offer those weekly live lessons that I mentioned. We have discussions in, with our students um, that are embedded into the course. We reach out to them. We offer additional care. I, I've done fun things in my class as well. Um, I, you know, random dance breaks or <laughs> Disneyland trips. I, you know, I try to make it fun because the times we're living in are tough. So coming to my classroom should be a breath of fresh air. At least that's my approach to it. <laughs> just, just, there you go. I love dance parties. <laughs> <laughs> Just for a few, a few seconds, uh, uh, we actually use the same technology similar to here where we are live with our students, they can see us and, and especially teaching cybersecurity courses or networking, all the technology has always been remote anyway. We have access to full hands-on lab, physical systems that's remote. So the students still able to access them and we do the live activities together. And it's a lot of fun, in fact, because everybody's mm -hmm. sitting at home, a lot of times it's hard to disconnect. So it's more the students not being able to, they kind of like, stay around and you stay there and we have tea time and unlike uh, dr waxmansky we don't dance but I, I probably should learn to do some of that too but what we do we have a tea time so we when we take a little break all of us can have some tea time and then continue to have some basic conversation and go back to work again which is very exciting so everything happens and that's the future anyway cloud computing where you don't have to have your system next to you even your desktop can be in the cloud so that's what we actually model at our university as well too the future. Well, thank you so much, both uh, Dr. Waxmansky and Dr. Lamore, um, for your insights today with our audience. And um, we'll be back in a moment or two um, with our next speaker, who's actually going to talk to us about durable value. Okay, thank you. Thank you.